Hi, this is Indus, founder and CEO of Quolum. Welcome to Quolum Live. Let me introduce the speaker of this session, Valun Chan. Valun is the CFO of Plastic. Earlier, he was a VP Finance at LinkedIn. He will share the finance professional's view on sustaining company growth with SaaS tools and the biggest gaps finance teams face in enabling SaaS productivity. The session will also focus on the new transformation charter for the CFO to drive growth alongside efficient capital management. Valun is joining us from the San Francisco Bay Area. Let's hear Valun's point of view. So, so looking back in my career, I started out with uh, industrial and then shift to CPG and then to financial services before coming to the Bay Area and focus on the tech. And, and I think, I think it's been pretty interesting in terms of the transformations of the role, the finance play, and also, and that, that actually would tie back to different tools and applications that we use. Um, early in my career, I would say that like, it could be the nature of the business I was in. It was about margin expectations and, and predictability because in industrial business, in CPG, the margin is tend to be a little bit more, uh, uh, not as profitable as like a tech software company. So it was a lot of questions about predictability, expense management, and then so we know how much we want to invest in marketing to drive the top line. And because of that, like a lot of times, like finance could play the role of a little bit of police, uh, if, if that makes sense. And then over time, when I switch over to uh, uh, financial services, then it's about speed and executions. What I mean by that is in financial services, it was a lot about deleveraging, uh, meaning like how we used to talk about like how, how quickly can you flip a $1, meaning that like if you use a $1 to, as a leverage to basically loan out $3 or $5, because that's how financial services work. And then you securitize, make that fixed income product and sell it. And then use the same one dollar again to basically generate the profit again. So, so, so it was about speed, and it was about actually that was like the first time that big data matters because the actuary on the statistic model on, on how profitable a cohort of a consumer or customer could be uh, would make sense from a risk taking from a risk and ROI standpoint. So that was my first exposure to big data, and then tech is a whole different different story is. Is the value propositions, the speed, the transparency, and as I mentioned earlier, in industrial in CPG finance play more like, hey, managing expenses, the predictability and visibility was important. When I think about the finance today, especially in the tech, is about being a business partner with the subject matter expertise in finance, if that makes sense. And I don't like to call expense anymore. Like they call investments. So every headcount that we use, every every marketing dollar that we spend is not about how is it against budget, is what's the ROI on it. So every time when we make investment, like we know exactly why we're spending it, how we like how much are we getting back in terms of a return in the longer term. So the mindset and then the role has shifted. Uh, dramatically over time in 20 years. And I don't think it's because I'm in tech. I think just in general, in finance, the role that we have played uh, has shifted over the last 20 years. If I think about, um, if I oversimplify an organization, right, you always have the CEO, uh, uh, the uh, COO who can basically lead like the, the, um, like both the go to market as well as like the product development and then you have the finance and then you have like the chro well i think about that 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 team not i'm oversimplifying again because because most organizations are a little bit more complex than that but the ceo will always be the visionary right like the visionary about like hey what's the directions what's the passion what's the vision what's the mission we're driving toward and then the ceo will come and, and then and then the product team either be part of the ceo team or separate they, they think about like Hey, what's the product roadmap? What's the value proposition? What are the pain points that we're solving for? And then the CHL comes in to basically bring other talents to help us to execute, right? And then the go to market team, either sales focus or marketing focus, they are the one that to capture the values that the product team create following the visions of the CEO. 
Now, all of this sounds great, right? And I totally make sense, but you need, but what the CFO role plays is like, how do we quantify and translate all this great value and ambitions we have into what does that mean for the investment? And, and tying back to what we talked about in the first question is like in the past, I, like for lack of a better term, we basically put the pencil and, and, and paper together and try to just do the math, right? Now, I think the, the role the CFO has to play is kind of think through that, right, together. Uh, I myself is a is a funnel thinker, if that makes sense. I think of everything in funnel of like, hey, if this is the X number of traffic coming to the website, that translates to X number of leads, da 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 da. What are each of the key levers along the funnel that finance team can can help to provide insight? So when I think about finance, the spectrum of the finance is visibility that brings predictability. And predictability lead to insights, and insights would drive to support the strategy. So over time, we have moved from the left to the right, and then the the, the role that finance plays it really depends on the nature of the business, as well as actually the personalities and the skill set of the leadership team, right? Because if you have a super quantitative uh, COO, the role that the finance has to play on the further side and the right is probably a little bit less, right? Because you don't need, because otherwise you keep getting the effort. Um, so it's a combination of like the evolutions or, or over time in terms of our fun, the role the finance play and which is just wider the spectrum and then exactly how much time they spend in each of those four buckets in, in, in that definitions, it really depends on the stage of the company in there as well as like the, the, the DNA of the leadership team. The thing that most excited about to me is there are more and more new applications coming out or, or software to help to basically like, it could be, it could be ML machine learning, it could be AI, all these different fancy and, and amazing tools that's coming out. Like as an example, like coming from LinkedIn, I was always impressed by like obviously Microsoft has a really strong finance team. And then, so we have a lot of strong talents, a lot of great talents who basically provide the full spectrum from our visibility into the insight and strategy, right? But at the same time, in parallel, there's always a machine learning uh, application that guys basically check and balance, like are we really being over optimistic or being over conservative? And you'd be surprised the accuracy of that, of that tool that they have. And I was always amazed by it. And now the challenge and the benefits of SaaS is the challenge is there will be times that it will be diminished return, meaning like the, the return on investment, as we talked about earlier, like the first couple of tools probably give you the maximum return on investment. But having the 15th application versus the 16th, debatable. I'm just randomly picking two numbers because at that point, like how much incremental value you bring in, as well as what is the utilization they're using for each one of them. Because how many times can you really AI or optimize your headcount forecasting or your software uh, investment type of things? Now, the beauty of the SaaS business is, unlike the on-premises applications in the past, I'm dating myself in the 90s or 80s, where you have to have an army of uh, engineers coming on board to basically spend one to two months or sometimes three months. Uh, I remember my early day at CPG, it was a two years uh, implication, uh, implementations project for, uh, for craft foods for one huge applications that, that they have to install. By the time the new application was installed, it's already dated. I think there are two sides of the question, right? I mean, one, one side of it, if you're a business that provides this is actually a good time to test, like for two reasons. One is one of the selling points in the last 10 years about SaaS business is predictability of the revenue. That being said, today, if you're a SaaS business and your customer is facing headwind and they knock on your door, I mean, there's actually a two-step function, two-step process here. One is if you truly a value add product with the perfect product market fit, your customer will not call you because they need, it's a mission critical product SaaS that they need. So they would, they would not unplug it. If the answer is maybe on that question, then at least the second question is, are you truly a SaaS company? If your customer call you and say, I need to cancel my contract now, 
or reduce my contract by 50%? And this is the, the question that is going to be super challenging, right? Because with every recession, you and I, I mean, you, I cannot predict when, when the rebound is going to happen, but it will happen at some point in the long term. So you can get balance on, do you forego the short-term benefits of holding your customer to that, uh, to the contract that they have signed? Or do you basically say, I will value the, uh, I'll value the long-term values of the relationship with this customer and give them the, the, you know, the break at this moment and expect that in the longer term, we will get the value back. It's a tough call, especially with startups when you have a cash burn uh, challenge that you try to manage during this time. So to me, like it, with this environment, it's a really good task of the business model. So that's one. And then the same exact question flipped to the other side is actually as a CFO now, right? I would say, so Classic is a great position both from a business standpoint and also from a financial standpoint. So it's not as urgent as some, some other sectors got hit. Because the because the COVID nineteen, so we're in a good, good great position. But it's also perfect timing for me as as a CFO, regardless in plastic or at LinkedIn. I always ask the questions like, are these nice to have or must have SaaS applications? And it's going back to what we talked about earlier. The the twentieth applications is not going to provide as much return on investment as the nineteen, and and that's just how how typically investment would work. And, and this is the time that really tests the model of like, are you truly a SaaS company? As well as, are you really providing the, the product market fit and solving a, a mission critical problem for your customer? I think the reason that we have a lot of white space, as you mentioned in finance is because financial, financial tools tend to be internal products that's needed by a GNA organizations. So most investment in product tend to go to how can I increase my top line, which is the sales and marketing tool. And then the second would be like infrastructure that keep the machines running, right? Like I remember the first, one thing didn't change in my last 20 plus years is when I was at Kraft Foods, you never want a manufacturing plant run of milk. Now work, when I work for LinkedIn, we never want a website to be done. So that's always the, the important things besides the sales marketing, right? And which is why the you see a lot of investment going to infrastructure. But then when it comes to back office, like uh, finance or HR or other g and organization or even legal, then you see the, the new product uh, development is probably lagged a little bit behind. And what I like to see would be something similar in those two other categories where like, for example, in sales or marketing, you see a lot of different CRM and platform that, that the platform may not provide all the stuff by itself, but there are different API plug into it that is like easily accessible, is a lot more integrated. Today, um, regardless the scale of the company, so I, I, I work for, uh, I mean, at LinkedIn I actually lived through the entire full life cycle of a corporation from private, public, IPO to, to being acquired by the largest tech company in the world, Microsoft, we all still have to jump between different systems on a daily basis. Mm. There's not one platform you go in there and then you can access everything. And, and then ideally one day that we, there will be, I think that, that is a great opportunity if someone can come up with the one platform that, that you can just access everything through it with a really easy uh, uh, user uh, in the action or, or, or UAD, uh, UAX that, that, that's easily accessible by any user across different functions. I think that would be super interesting. Like there's a reason why Excel has been around for so many years and people are willing to give it up, right? Cause it serves a purpose. It makes sense. Right. And, and it's not because it's finance people or accounting folks love to like live in Excel. I, my personal life, entire personal life is in Excel. When it comes to like flexibility analysis, it gives you a lot more horsepower as well as flexibility. But what it doesn't do well is if you have to talk to non-finance people, it's probably not a good idea to pull up Excel spreadsheets, right? So I think PowerPoint was one way that they tried to do it. And then I think now you see more and more like different data dashboards or, or even um, 
the Microsoft example, like Power BI is one that you basically you can link to the Excel that can create more graphic things that, that is easier to consume. So it's kind of tying back to what we talked about earlier that like, is it one platform in some way, like, um, like a lot of sales CRM that does it, right? Like there's a, there's a bunch of data behind it that either the sales staff or sales development uh, reps want to use it or the AE wants to use it. But then the VP of sales, if they have a sales, they don't want to, they don't need to get into the detail and they have a dashboard that automatically basically powered by those data. So if, if that's something that can basically allow the, the power of Excel or something similar to that to allow for finance professional to basically cut and slice information to provide the insight that we talk about and then translate to something easily uh, absorbed for a different level of audience, I think that would be super interesting. I think it's less about which applications, but understand the structure of data. So uh, for some of the folks who were hearing this conversation, they may not remember something called, or they may not know or remember there's a there's an Excel application called, I mean, there's a Microsoft application called Microsoft Access. Back in the day, we had to basically link the tables <laughs> and we have to line up the data in certain ways so they, the tables could be linked. And I still think that way. And it could be just the fact that because that's how I started my career. So when I think about every application or any even finance system, like I never got really, uh, like for example, like planning system, right? There's a lot of great system out there. You have Workday, you have Interplan, you have Adaptive Insight, you have uh, Hyperion Space, and all the other different ones out there. But when it comes down to, is the, to me, the really difference is the interface. But the data behind it is the same. Like in terms of like, I know it's not exactly the same, but it's very similar how they structure. So if someone new coming into finance, like if you want to be able to basically like build the foundations of like, hey, I want to be able to get the visibility and drive predictability, you have to understand the data structure. And then if once you understand how the data structure actually put together, then you're halfway there to basically get the most important step one of any finance job, which is getting the data. Like if you, my guess if you survey most of the finance professionals who are not the CFO uh, or, or like basically the, like, like from the analyst to like the director level, they probably would tell you they, they spent an uneven amount of, of their time to basically get the data before they get to the analytics. So, and, and some of it is because of the system, the other part of it is, is actually understanding how the data structure works. Thank you.